Well, this is the 10th and final lesson of the NEFT Video Manual of Fly Time. Speaking for myself, I hope you've enjoyed this series as much as I've enjoyed serving as your host and narrator. Producing this series has been a prodigious task requiring hundreds of man hours of work by a group of very dedicated NEFT member volunteers. Most of the work took place behind the camera. And on behalf of all of the NEFT members involved in the planning and the execution of this project, it was an exciting adventure for us. An adventure designed to set you on the road to your own fly tying adventure. And we hope that this has been a benefit for you as much as it has been for us. Well, let's take a look at the final fly in this series. The light Cahill is the common name applied primarily to several species of light-colored mayflies of the Stenonema and Stenacron genera. In general, these flies hatch sporadically in late spring and early summer. A sporadic hatch is one where a few insects emerge steadily over a period of several hours, usually in the morning in contrast to the synchronized hatch wherein thousands of flies hatch within a short period of time. Unlike the fast, furious, and sometimes frustrating fishing of a synchronized hatch, Fishing the light Cahill when trout are taking the naturals can provide relaxed and satisfying fishing, often to very selective trout rising repeatedly in the same spot. At such times, the light Cahill is a must-have fly. The two skills apply to two different methods of mounting the wings. Keep in mind that there are many other patterns that use the same style of wings. Our tire for this lesson is Jim Buck who will brief you on the materials used in the light Cahill. Except for the color, there is nothing new about the tail, body, hackle of the light Cahill. The tail is cream or light ginger hackle fibers, and the hackle collar is the same. The body is dubbed with cream, fur, or synthetic dubbing material. The thread is also cream, and a size 12 hook or 14 will match the size of the natural insect. There are two choices of material for the wings and two ways to mount them. The standard pattern calls for the wood duck flank feather. You notice that some of the flank feathers have a white and black bands at the tips. The wings are fashioned from the unmarked feathers. Notice that these two feathers have different shapes. One is symmetrical and one is not. Both are usable, but each requires a different method of mounting. The wood duck feathers are rather expensive. And once a protected species, woodies are not plentiful. For that reason, many tires use mallard feathers that have been dyed approximately to the wood duck color. They never match the delicate coloration and markings of the genuine wood duck, but that doesn't bother the trout. Now let's take a quick look at the two skills used in mounting the wings. Mounting the wings with the fibers on the stem requires a symmetrical feather. A lopsided feather will give you lopsided wings. Prepare the feather by snipping off the tip of the stem at a point where the fibers are at least as long as twice the width of the gape. Cut only the stem, not the fibers. On a small feather, strip off the lower fibers, leaving about 3 eighths of an inch for the wings. If there are enough fibers left on a large feather, don't strip them, just stroke them back. The thread has been positioned one-third of the shank length behind the eye. Tie in the stem, three or four turns are enough. Pull the feather back so that it extends two gape widths forward of the tie-in point. Lift the wings and cross the thread in front of the wing. Wrap only enough turns to keep the wing erect.
Split the fibers into two equal parts and cross the thread between them. Keep the wings separate with several crisscross figure eight wraps ending in front of the wings. While the white wolf and the atoms were tied with the wings in the 30 to 45 degree angle half spent position, this fly should have nearly upright wings with only a small angle between them. Cross in back of the wing and bind down the remaining fibers as you wind the thread back to the rear tie-in point. From a cream or light ginger hackle cape, select a feather with long barbs and strip off a small bunch for the tail. The sides of the cape usually provide the best tailing material. Measure the tail so that it extends one shank length beyond the bend and tie it in. Some tires find it easier to tie the tail in first to prevent messing up the wings. However, this means an extra layer of thread in order to get back to the wing position and this makes for a heavier fly. To prepare for the dubbing, wax the thread. There are a wide variety of prepared natural and synthetic dubbing materials available. We will use a bleached and dyed beaver fur for this fly. Here, Jim is forming a very loose noodle of fur, a dubbing technique that's been around for ages. Roll the noodle onto the thread in one direction only. Wrap the dubbing to form the abdomen, but leave a small space for tying in the hackle. You've seen quality hackle used in the last three lessons. Jim will attempt to tie this fly with a poor quality, webby hackle. This will demonstrate the problems that it can cause. Check the length of the hackle barbules against the gate. They should be one and a half times as long. The thick, stiff stem of this feather increases the diameter of the space that the hackle will be wrapped over. The limp, webby base of the fibers cause them to flare as the hackle is wound, whereas fibers from a quality hackle stand at right angles to the hook. This hackle will require considerable preening and trimming to spruce up the fly. There is difficulty in keeping one turn in front of another as the thick stem quickly fills the available space. Finally, the best part of the feather is cut off. Here, Jim is using the older style of whip finisher with spring arms. Notice that the curved tip of the tool rests on the hook as the fingers rotate the entire tool. The second method of mounting flank fiber wings makes use of fibers stripped from a lopsided feather or fibers left over from a previously used feather, as is the case here. Fold the opposite fibers together so that the tips match. This feather could also be tied in by the stem, but Jim strips them off in order to show how to tie a wing with fibers that are not on the stem. There will be no chance to pull them back to the proper two gape lengths, so make sure they are positioned at the right length to begin with. When they are tied firmly in place, Lift them upright and wind a lip of thread in front. Use only enough thread to hold them in this position. The technique of splitting and figure eighting is the same as before. 
Now add the tail, abdomen, hackle, and head. And except for lacquering, the fly is done. Let's review the construction of this popular fly.
there we have it. Ten lessons and 47 fly tying skills that'll serve as the foundation of your future fly tying. If you think the word foundation implies something to build upon, you're right. There are hundreds of little tricks, shortcuts, and techniques that we've not covered. Though fly tying is a rich tradition, new ideas, new materials, and new techniques are constantly being introduced. There's much to be learned from books, magazines, and videotapes. Fly fishing and fly tying clubs, such as the New England Fly Tires, provide contact and camaraderie with other fly tires who are always willing to share their knowledge. So we encourage you to build on the foundation that this series has provided. At this point, let's go on out to the river, and I'd like to show you a few ways to develop better line control in some fly casting situations on the stream. fly tying, fly fishing, these are all excuses for being outdoors to enjoy the wonders of nature such as you're seeing here this morning. Today in our lesson we're going to be going through some of the more basics and the needs, if you will, of understanding fly casting. I'm sure in the previous lesson some of you may have had some problems with some of the different casts that you've seen. Today we're going to be primarily discussing line control. In order to do that, we're going to demonstrate roll casting, over the shoulder casting, change of direction cast. We'll even get into a single haul and maybe even a double haul. All of these need line control in order to work. We'll begin demonstrating those when we get on the river. In previous lessons, you saw Dave Flint and Mike Beaupre execute the aerial roll cast pickup by aiming the cast into the air. Here's how to do it without dragging the fly across the water. Shake out enough line to allow you to lift the rod without moving the fly. The roll cast will pluck the fly cleanly off the water and a well-timed back cast sets up the next presentation. Shake out line, lift the rod, and roll cast. You can usually spot novice fly casters by the wide loop they throw. The wide loop is caused by a long and lazy casting stroke. The rod doesn't fully load, air resistance is greater, and total loss of line control often results. A tight loop requires a short, brisk casting arc, 60 degrees at most, 10 to 1 o'clock. Don't wave the rod. A sudden stop at the end of each stroke lets the inertia of the line fully load the rod. Back cast and forward cast, what's the difference? None really. Turn and they swap names. There's a forward cast and another forward cast. Whatever happened to the back cast? There's an over the shoulder cast, very handy at times. With an open stance they become right and left cast. The point is they are symmetrical, mirror images of each other. Now, which are the forward and which are the back casts? 
You really ought to try this. Some may think you're showing off, but it's a great way to get the feel of total line control. With nothing you can call a forward or a back cast, the line nevertheless can be laid down in any direction you choose. What we've demonstrated is total line control, something that needs to be practiced. The next step is going to be how to build speed into the line. In order to get greater distance, in order to fight a wind, the faster the line is going, the further it will go, either against a wind or in distance alone. That necessitates loading the rod so the rod can transfer its stored energy into the line and make the line go faster. We'll go out now and demonstrate how that can be done by two, two reasons. One, speeding up the rod hand and using your other hand to pull on the line and force more load into the rod. Let's go out and I'll demonstrate what I mean. Without a haul, the line speed equals the speed of the rod tip. A simplistic theory of the haul, here a single haul on the backstroke, is that the speed imparted by the haul is added to the speed imparted by the rod. Actually, most of the energy of the haul increases the bend of the rod, and that extra stored energy is released in the form of increased line speed when the rod recovers on the forward stroke. In the double haul, the line is pulled on both the back and the forward stroke. These long pulls on the line are often needed to increase the loading of a stiff 9 or 10 weight salmon or salt water rod. With a light trout rod, these very long hauls are not really needed. With light rigs, there is a better way. I'm showing you, in an exaggerated sense, the full double haul. Now, that may be effective to show you what the concept is, but the reality is that it only takes a flick of the wrist. Right here, just a little snap at that moment of power. Snap, snap. It's very, very minimal action to get tremendous line speed. Right now I'm shooting in a little headwind, and as you can see, with just a little flick of the wrist, right there, it still shoots up. Again, instead of this motion, what you're going to be more effective doing is flick, flick. Hitting that precise moment, having perfect line control. And that precise moment is when your line is straight behind you or straight in front of you. Again, a short flick of the wrist and flick of the wrist. You do not need to wear yourself out. Conserve your energy and make your casting more efficient. A lot of people ask us what type of equipment to buy, what the most important piece of equipment that you can own is. Yes, it's important to have a decent rod that you feel comfortable with and a good reel that'll not only hold line but work at least as a minimal drag. The most important singular piece of equipment, in a lot of people's opinion, are these right here, Polaroid glasses. Polaroid glasses have a very unique property. They have a way of screening reflected light so that it doesn't come into your eye. Most effective use of that technology is when you eliminate all of the backlight with side shields, and there are two kinds. There's a solid kind and there's a leather kind. Close-fitting lenses, and side shields to block out reflected light that gets behind the lens and comes back into your eye will give you the ability not just to see more comfortably because of less eye strain, but it actually will allow you to see through the surface glare down into the water. And this gives you several advantages. It gives you the advantage of seeing where your fly is, how your line is reacting to the drift or your fly is reacting to the drift. But it also allows you to see fish when the occasion is appropriate. It may just be a flash that may tell you that your fish has taken a nymph. It may be a fish that has come and looked at your fly and refused your fly, and there's a good indication for you to maybe change. These Polaroid glasses you can pick up as clip-ons for prescription glasses. They can also be used uh, as a standard glass that you can pick up at any store for maybe oh, $9.95 up to $165. 
the quality of the glass is, is important, and I'm not sure you get what you pay for when you pay $165, but you more than get what you pay for when you pay $9.95. They're plastic, they will scratch, you'll have to take care of them. They're really disposable. It's three or four fishing trips, they scratch up, throw them away, get another pair. If you don't fish a lot, get plastic disposables. Otherwise, get a good pair of optical quality glass lenses, and that will be the one piece of equipment you never want to leave home without. Nothing robs a cast of distance more than trying to shoot line that's lying on the water or in the bottom of a boat. On the cast, the dead weight of the line must be lifted several feet before it even reaches the first stripping guide. The shooting line should be held as close to the stripping guide as possible, and there's nothing better than a stripping basket for doing just that. Retrieved line is dropped into the basket in loose coils, and the pegs keep the coils from tangling as the cast is made. Instead of lifting several feet of line at once, the basket allows the coils to feed out smoothly, one coil at a time. Ocean fish, prey and predator alike, can move at lightning speed. Tucking the rod under the arm frees both hands to strip the fly in order to imitate a fleeing bait fish. You can buy a stripping basket or you can make your own. This one's homemade. It's an ordinary plastic dishpan slotted for a belt with pegs glued on with silicone cement. Personally, I wouldn't dream of fishing the salt water without the stripping basket any more than I would go without my Polaroid glasses. On behalf of the New England Fly Tires and everyone involved in this video production, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Hope you've had some fun. Hope you've learned something. Most of all, I hope that we've encouraged you to sit down, tie your own flies so that when you go fishing, you'll get double the pleasure of catching a fish, this time on a fly that you tied yourself. Good luck.